The 1950s are also known as one of the great decades of consumerism in our nation's history. And we've talked about the 1920s. It's another age of uh, consumption. And maybe the 1990s are another decade in which uh, Americans are... Uh, kind of obsessed with consumption. But in the 1950s, uh, more and more Americans have money, they have the means, they want to buy stuff, and there is a proliferation of new uh, things for them to buy. Um, Between 1955 and 1960, on average, wages rose 22%. So people have much more money in their pockets, uh, and they're looking for things to buy. I mentioned to you um, previously the automobile, which enjoys a resurgence. That's certainly one of the things that people are interested in buying. Um, But there are lots of other um, developments during this time, improvements in um, things like refrigerators and appliances, um, lots of new goods on the market. Um, M&Ms were created in the 1950s. Wonder Bread was created in the 1950s. Marlboro cigarettes created in the 1950s, and many, many other things. Certainly the most important of these new uh, commodities is the television, which I'll describe in more detail in just just a moment. Uh, Let me just kind of update where we are by the end of the 1950s in terms of what the nation looks like. Uh, The population is about 174 million. And by the end of the decade, there are about 74 million cars on the roads. So that average is out to a little bit more than one car per family. Uh, so the automobile industry has certainly enjoyed a resurgence. Uh, as well, almost every family owns a television. Four out of five families owns a television by the end of the decade. It is the transformative uh, invention of its age. We've talked previously about the railroads and television, uh, uh, radio. Um, down the road, we will talk about personal computers and things like that. In the 50s, it is the television that transforms things. Well, first of all, you need to consider that now we have, for the first time, a medium that allows all of us to see, in addition to hearing, the radio allowed us to hear, but now we can see, we can watch the same events transpiring at the same moment. And so there's a real cultural phenomenon. Uh, The country watching the same television show or seeing the same event on television, major sporting events and things of that nature. Uh, And so we're all having this shared experience that um, binds the country together in a way that it hadn't been before. Uh, Consider as well that in this era there were only a handful of channels, uh, about three channels, so that at any given time the entire country was likely to be watching the same show, as opposed to today when there are 200 plus channels and so everyone is kind of scattered off watching uh, their own thing. So television has um, a number of profound uh, impacts on society. One thought is that it was going to lead to the uh, the end of Hollywood and the end of movies. And there have been a number of times when Hollywood is kind of racked by these crises uh, that we think Hollywood is just going to die. But certainly the invention of television was uh, a significant blow to the movies. Why go to the movies when you can watch them at home? Well, as you know, Hollywood responds. Hollywood adapts. And while movie attendance does decline, um, it doesn't completely disappear. And so one of the things that Hollywood does, you think about the answer to that question today. Why do you go to the movies instead of um, watching something at home? Well, there's an experience in the movie theater that you might not have at home. Uh, Those moments when you say, 
that's one that you really need to see in the movie theater. You can think about uh, a movie like Avatar or something like that, where seeing the movie in the theater is just a, uh, a better experience than watching it at home. So Hollywood has to adapt, and it is in the 1950s and uh, moving forward that we start to see more of a trend towards big blockbuster films, special effects, uh, movie scores that, and, and sound you know, that really just uplifts the whole experience. So the movie industry does have to adapt. There are other related kinds of industries to this. Uh, frozen TV dinners become a fixture in households uh, for the next 20 years or so. TV Guide becomes the most popular magazine in the country. Um, mass advertising, television commercials, uh, again, sort of transforming the way that is done. So what kinds of uh, shows are people watching on television? Well, uh, an earlier textbook that I read um, described television in this way, and I, I, I like this description. Um, they described most of the programming of the 50s as white, polite, and satisfied. White, polite, and satisfied. So we see kind of a uh, happy, sanitized, white, middle-class world uh, on the television of the 1950s. Shows like Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, The Honeymooners, these are all very popular television shows. The most watched show of the 50s was I Love Lucy. This might be a, a comedy that uh, some of you have seen even now. Uh, I Love Lucy in some ways fits the mold. It bears a resemblance to these other very popular sitcoms of the 50s. But like any kind of edgy and very popular show, it, it's pushing the limits a little bit. So it doesn't fit perfectly in that white, polite, and satisfied mold. First of all, the main character is a woman, uh, Lucille Ball, a fantastic comedian, a tremendous kind of physical comedy uh, in that show. So that's a little bit different. Uh, her husband, Ricky Ricardo, is a Hispanic figure. Uh, so here you have a show that is based on a woman and a Hispanic man. Again, it's a little bit unusual. And if you've ever watched the show, or if you want to, um, you know, go check out an episode on YouTube, they are still very good today. They uh, still very funny today. But they also push the envelope a little bit. Many of the episodes, almost every episode, in fact, involves Lucy getting involved in some kind of zany adventure. Uh, that normally a, a, wooden, a woman wouldn't find herself in. She stumbles into some role outside of the household and chaos ensues. Where we do kind of come back to that traditional format is that at the end of every episode of I Love Lucy, who comes in to restore order? Who comes in to save the day? It's the husband. And where does Lucy always end up? She's back in the home, back in the kitchen, uh, and largely happy to be there as well. So in the 1950s, I Love Lucy kind of pushes those barriers a little bit, but doesn't ever quite break through. It's not until the 60s, and we'll talk about some of the shows in the 60s, that begin to break down those barriers. Um, we also begin to see that the television is a truly important uh, part of our lives. It's not just a novelty. It's not just a neat thing. It begins to transform our lives. In 1952, for the first time, a limited um, viewership can see the presidential debates on television. That's a process that grows uh, throughout the decade. In 1954, I mentioned to you the Army McCarthy hearings. This is the first time many Americans got to see McCarthy in all of his badgering and sort of creepy behaviors. And it immediately dashed uh, his career. And then in 1960, very famously, the presidential um, debates between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Um, Kennedy, who is young and handsome and charismatic and funny, came across very well on television. Richard Nixon, a little bit dour, 
less witty, less charming, a uh, little bit sweaty. And any, but most of the people who watched the debates on television uh, credited Kennedy with a victory. And people who listened on the radio, oddly enough, thought that Nixon had come out ahead. And so the television was instrumental in Kennedy winning what proved to be an extremely razor-close presidential election. Um, John F. Kennedy, after the election himself, said, we wouldn't have had a prayer without that gap.